Right, so, um, yeah, this, so this talk, um, it was, it's a real honour to be asked to give a talk. I'm really, really happy to, um, to speak to everybody, um, and especially to the postgraduate um, research community. It's really nice to be able to um, give a talk that is sort of a little bit different and more wide ranging. So when Lucy asked me to do this, I kind of threw a few ideas at her. <laughs> And she said, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and this is, yeah, this is kind of what I've, um, what, how it's evolved and it's kind of, yeah, trying to touch on a lot of different ideas. Um, so hopefully it will be interesting. Um, so this is my introduction. This is who I am. I'm at Liverpool. Um, so I want to kind of focus in on the idea of archaeology as connection um you know this is obviously the theme and um rather than sort of going into the detail about the kind of archaeology the kind of archaeology i do so neanderthals by seeing stuff i kind of wanted to take a bigger picture um a view of things so a little bit about my story and hopefully the ideas and the things that i'm speaking about will also connect with other people's stories, people who are, people who are listening today and people who, who might watch this talk later. So thinking about where I am, um, how I have sort of reached my sort of position in, 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 in career in what I do and everything. Um, one of the things that I do often say when, when people are asking me about career and development and all this is um, that I like to do away with the idea of um careers as straight lines and sort of rigidly defined and things like this and i think everybody knows this now that you know traditional academic careers don't really exist but it's still difficult for us to sort of um i think feel safe to acknowledge that that's more likely than not um not going to be the way that our careers look anymore um and our careers are going to look more like a river a messy braided river than a very straight pathway um and that absolutely is my experience um so um my career if you look at my cv it sort of looks like this on the left, academic, various different places have been, things have done, different degrees, um, postdoc at Bordeaux, um, not immediately after PhD, but I had a postdoc. Um, and then now I'm at Liverpool um, as an honorary fellow. So that kind of looks fairly normal. But actually, if you if you go through through the waves of the river in the middle of the picture here, um, then you have much more of the reality of what I actually have done and, and what I'm interested in, which is all this other stuff sort of exploding out of, um, of my career and my interests. And um, yeah, lots of different things, all to do with communication and connecting people <laughs> with archaeology. And this, you know, this is, fundamentally actually what I what drives me it's not just my interest in the past which is stimulating and intellectual and fascinating and fun but I also want to share it with people I want to share it with other archaeologists but people who are not archaeologists as well so this is very much kind of you know the the picture of of um what I think archaeology should also be about um so just to you know like to place it why why am i here talking um today um well i am a member of the department um i'm an honorary member of the department um partly because i applied for an um, lectureship uh I want to say last year, but because of COVID, my time scale's gone. Yes, it was. It was only last year. <laughs> my goodness. Um, yes, and so I applied for that job just as this book, Kindred, was coming out. Um, and while 
you know, I was a bit disappointed not to get the job. In fact, actually, I think it has um, worked out for the best. Um, the person who got the job, Jenny, is an amazing and fantastic teacher. But in fact, not doing that and, and being very generously offered the honorary fellowship has meant that I've been able to focus on this part of my career and actually just allow that to become the dominant part so why am why am I here because I, I published a book and it was successful and it was about Neanderthals and um we have a few of the translation covers that have appeared so far um it's been a joy an absolute joy to see so many people enjoying this book and sharing pictures and sharing their experiences of it so that's kind of one side to why I'm giving a talk right now. Um, this is sort of who I am archaeologically. This is my archaeological credentials. Um, this is the other side of why I'm here, um, which is that all of this to do with the book and everything has partly come from a desire to connect and communicate through Twitter and social media. Um, I got my book contract through contact on Twitter. Um, so that, that connection is really key. But if we go deeper back in time, why else am I here? Well, because I got into archaeology when I was a teenager. Um, so that's me on my first excavation when I was, uh, I think, six, 16 or 15 um, at Fishbourne Roman Palace. Um, but if you go further back in time, then I have an interest in archaeology, um, which is very much like a lot of people who actually have some sort of an overlapping interest just in the material world, in the natural world and things like this. So this is a, a little drawing of rabbit skulls I did when I don't even know how old I was, probably nine or so. Um, and I'm comparing a very old rabbit skull with a, a, a very new rabbit skull. So I'm, I'm doing some taphonomy <laughs> when I'm really, you know, a kid, kids notice this kind of thing. But yeah, so this is sort of just, this is the basis of becoming an archeologist and where my interest in communication and things comes from but why specifically write kindred um other books on neanderthals uh, exist in abundance there have been many um i wanted to write something that was a bit different um and so this actually is part of the reason why i wrote kindred this other book here um sapiens you know um as it says on its cover the million copy bestseller and whatever one you know has one's opinions about the um factual content in sapiens or the perspectives it takes it i think is part of the reason i wrote kindred purely because it shows how people have a massive interest and an appetite and a fascination for um connecting with narratives about origins and deep history and that aspect of archaeology so that kind of is I mean I didn't write Kindred because of this book but as I went along I realized actually that's what I'm trying to do while also having like the massive archaeological detail and stuff um so this is this kind of led me to think you know what what are we doing when we do archaeology and um, it is actually about trying to connect um and when i was uh with the spanish um edition of the book i was very lucky to um give a talk uh several talks in spain a couple of weeks ago and at the uh, museum in burgos um there was a really great uh, panel discussion with uh, juan luis oswego and uh Maria uh, Martin Antares and Juan Luis was asking me um like talking about the title and kindred and the fact that there isn't a Spanish word that communicates this which is why they just called it Neanderthales um because there there is not a word that that communicates all the different things that the word kindred does um and it was a really nice thing to discuss actually like what does it mean what are we trying to communicate why did I think that that was a good title for the book and it, it is a perfect title for the kind of book that I wanted to write about Neanderthals um you know kindred means relations in blood but other kinds of relations too social relations that are nothing to do with family necessarily but other forms of relation but even more also the idea of kindred spirits that 
you can have a common way of being or a common way of looking at the world. And so all of those things wrapped together is kind of what I was trying to communicate in choosing that title about the book and to help people, I guess, connect with those those ideas about Neanderthals, which I think is very, that encapsulates how, how we see Neanderthals today. But there are these other ideas as well um, that I think sort of, yeah, encapsulate what archaeology is also about. Um, so, you know, you might have heard of um, kith and kin, um, kindred and kith. Kith is like kindred, but a little bit different. Um, so sort of relations with other people who are like not your family, um, but also having relationships of knowledge and of land. We don't really use this word at all anymore. It's, it's fallen out of use apart from in that phrase kith and kin. Um, but actually, I think that is a lot of what archaeology is about. And then there is this other beautiful word, which is a Welsh word. I'll probably mispronounce it, Hiraeth, Hiraeth, um, something like that, um, which is, again, another word in the way that kindred has no Spanish equivalent. This word in Welsh has no equivalent in English, but it is about a strong longing, a yearning for a place or a time that is now lost. Um, and if, if <laughs> you know, I think if we're honest as archeologists, we, we feel a bit of that about the past. Um, you know, that's why we're so interested in it because it's gone and it's inaccessible and we're trying to reconnect with it. So all these ideas are kind of, I think, worth considering. Um, and really this is what I was trying to accomplish in writing the book and um, to try and weave together archaeology, all of the scientific stuff, all of the facts, all of the amazing things, and the history of archaeology, the evolution of archaeology, the evolution of our ideas, but also do that by telling stories um, and narrative as a means to help people connect emotionally with all these different things. Um, and one of the the ways I did this was I tried to write the book accessibly just as a baseline. Um, I have some narrative bits in there, but also I was very lucky to work with the artist um, who is also an archaeologist, Alison Atkin. Um, and some of the images that we produced together kind of really communicate these ideas about connection and um, yeah, sort of the idea of trying to bridge time and things like this to really help people understand, you know, what archeologists do, but this weird thing that we do as archeologists, which is literal time travel in our sites as we're digging. Um, and that we are really, you know, connecting across that fourth dimension with the past. Um, to give people ideas about what does it mean for us to connect with Neanderthals today? through archaeology but also through rethinking the antitiles and also to consider those connections that were directly made in the Pleistocene as groups met each other as homo sapiens people and the antitiles met and sometimes had sex and babies and interbreeding um, and then also I really wanted to try and I guess write a book that would help people connect emotionally and to also understand that there is this physical you know thing that literally joins us today with the past um, and this was really important but if you look at this image you will also notice that um, all of these people are women and this is something that is that was sort of a personal perspective that I took um, writing the book I wanted to include those stories um, and this links to sort of another thing that um, is of interest for me um, and I think is of importance in archaeology and thinking about these ideas about connection and, and kin within archaeology, um, which is my work is um, doing trailblazers. So um, trailblazers is a, well, I don't know how we describe ourselves. We're sort of an anarchic group of um, for women who set up um, a project, a process, I don't know 
what we call it because it's it's been very organic um in 2013 initially to create a resource an online resource um to highlight and celebrate the role of women in archaeology geology and paleontology um and this image here connects sort of to my interest and um, so this is at the excavations of taboon um at mount carmel in 1932 um so here i don't know if you can see my little arrow moving around but person on the right there is jaquetta hawks with a beret and the person right next to her there with a little matching beret is dorothy garrett and they are looking and preparing the cast of the neanderthal taboon woman's uh, skeleton to be removed from the site so as somebody who works in Pleistocene, neanderthal stuff the stories of women in these fields are of very strong interest to me and you have in you know some people like dorothy Goward, who are just massively famous in history of science anyway but she also has her own interesting stories and you know i can't think of somebody who really needs a biography in archaeology more than her she still hasn't got one um you know but sort of just to think about trailblazers a bit um so this is you know the trailblazers website if you haven't been on it and um, we have oh i counted them today 268 posts so far of um women um who work in in archaeology and the earth sciences it's an ever-growing thing um the vast majority of our posts now unlike the early days are submitted by the wider community which is lovely um because of our <laughs> evolving career situations um we're, we're not always that fast at getting them up and edited and posted but we still receive them and, and it's still an ongoing process we've got lots coming through and we've been really happy actually to have more involvement especially um through uh Suzanne Pillard Birch and Brenna Hassett who are two of the Trailblazers team and um, they have students who have done work on producing new posts in, in Trailblazers as part of their um their undergraduate degrees um which is wonderful so we're sort of getting all these different connections and networks with with new generations of people who are interested in this so this is you know important um, but something that has always been, um, I think, from relatively early for us um, coming through as important is that women are more than just isolated anomalies to celebrate, you know, like famous names that we know. There's all this persistent sort of impression that, in fact, there's this whole web of women active um, at whatever period you look at. It's just that most of them aren't that famous, um, but they're all networked and connected to each other in in many different ways um so you know we're we're very interested in producing things like this this is from an article that's uh just out in bbc history uh magazine um where you know you can see here's dorothy garrett in the middle and here's some of the connections she has um to uh to different women um working around the same time the 1930s um, and also there is a new really cool new project um i can't remember the funding body but um uh um that has oh, i can't remember the name of it sorry um it's on twitter anyway <laughs> um there's a new project which actually is taking this forward um as an academic thing not trailblazers work but this idea of looking behind the big names um so this is very exciting and i do have to give a shout here to the other reason why I'm here and why I'm do, talking about trailblazers and why I was able to actually even finish my book largely is because of the trailblazers team. So here they are. This is this is the four of us, the network. Um, and I already mentioned Brenna um, here, Susie, and there's Victoria Herridge there. So this is a combined thing. This is again from this new BBC history um, article and pay attention to this person up here um this is peggy piggott and so this will link to my next the next part of the talk um so peggy piggott got a lot more fame than she has ever had in the past 12 months i think um outside archaeology because she is one of the people the characters in the film the dig and i'd imagine most people 
listening um, to this have at least heard of the dig if they haven't seen it. Um, so it's really interesting as a film, a uh, Netflix film, um, hugely, hugely popular, one of their most watched things, I think, um, nominated for some awards. Um, but I find it really interesting because it's kind of like a 21st century vision of archaeology and it is so much better than many of the other famous sort of exposures to archaeology that people who, are, who don't work in archaeology get, you know, Indiana Jones, Tomb Raider, whatever. This is totally different. Um, and there are some things we can critique about the dig and I have myself wrote I wrote a piece for the times you know what did they get wrong what did they get right things like did the ship really look like that this uh Anglo-Saxon ship that was excavated um but one of the things that I did talk about and critique is the representation of Peggy Piggott in this film um so here you can see uh, Lily James who plays Peggy um but I and some others um felt that the way that the film which did rather faithfully follow the novel it's based on um presented Peggy as a kind of unusual as a woman at the time um but also as rather more um unconfident and skilled than she really was um so by the time here's Peggy um she's wearing a boiler suit here she, she's not wearing this in every photograph we have of her digging at the site we don't have many um but she certainly wasn't wearing like little summer outfits as uh as the film showed most of the time um but she's well in there and she was brought in with her husband as a team because they were both very experienced so she's this is her directing her own excavation well before Sutton Hoo, and this is her in later years um, in a very nice film actually talking about Sutton Hoo. So the representation, oh, I've just noticed I've misspelled her surname, I should have two T's. Um, the representation of women and things in general is important and it is something that be, can be criticized about the dig. But, um, oh, and I have to say here as well, this is the other thing that trailblazers um, sort of links into with the dig. Um, Peggy Piggott, or as she was also known, Margaret Guido, was one of the women who uh, we featured, along with the artist Lenora Saunders, whose really fantastic idea this was, um, in a photographic exhibition of um, historic women in archaeology, but having them portrayed by women working today. So I think... Uh, this is a talk, I'm at Liverpool, I couldn't not put Rachel in, Rachel Pope, fantastic um, prehistorian, um, absolute model in, in many ways um, for me personally and also for, I think, um, new generations of archaeologists. So here she is being Peggy and um, here she is when we were invited to the Houses of Parliament to show this exhibition as part of the uh, celebrations for um, the centenary of, of the vote for women. So that was wonderful. So anyway, little, little uh, brief showing there. But to go back to the dig, what the dig did get right for me was the feeling of doing archaeology. And I know a lot of other archaeologists also feel this um, or had this reaction. And I love this shot. It's that kind of, yeah, that sort of summary out of time excavation in the landscape feeling um that that one gets on dig sometimes and so I thought that was really interesting that they really captured that feeling and in fact in the dig um connection is a real part of what that film is about about connecting to deep time to the archaeology itself um the physical act of excavation is shown as really significant in that film um the sediment itself getting in there doing the digging but the, and then the finding of things that that material power that archaeology has i think that is so you know it's what gives what it's what gives us our passion it's that material connection also it has so many wonderful themes about memory um i love this scene um at night where the, the little lads talking about you know space and time and and I thought that was really really beautifully done and also it's very clearly about life itself not just the past but 
the, the present day that life is fleeting and the future and yes there is this love story which is you know fiction it's made up but it kind of spoke to some of the the wider themes and I thought it was reasonably you know well done and, and it brought those things out so the digger something that that shares that resonance um is important I think as a as a presentation of what archaeology means to people um so talking about the present and the future and things like this archaeology today and bringing together back these themes about kindred and kith and community actually um what I think is really wonderful to see at the moment is that there is a lot of energy a lot of people working to improve what archaeology is how archaeology works and who for um today um there are various groups um some of which are sort of amount well before um before covid there was um sort of various meetings and things happening which resolved in, in this uh, idea um collective of lots of different bodies including British women archaeologists trailblazers um uh, CIFA, other ones as well um respect lots of different things coming together um after that there's also been a really fantastic um uh, establishment of European Society of Black and Allied Archaeologists and also sort of thinking about this idea about kith and kindred within archaeology and black black trial collective as a as an um as an anarchist sort of group which is also focused on micro grants um for students um so this is again something that is a great sort of i guess example of new connections being formed within archaeology itself um and kind of just coming towards the end of the talk really just thinking about where we look forward to the future um the future of archaeology itself as a practice um this picture i found today this is uh, from uh, penny foreman wonderful archaeologist um on twitter so i stole that off twitter um it's a caravan site eroding out onto the beach but this is an example of you know how we're thinking about what is the material record of this moment going to look like and this is something that there's a lot of literature being published about this at the moment a lot of very interesting ideas um things like how do we um i guess encompass things like the digital world that we live in how do we encompass the material record of that things like this that's all interesting and intellectually exciting and fascinating but there is this other side to anthropocene archaeology which is we are thinking much more reflexively like what is the future um what is our current future and this is very much this already before covid there was a distinct existential turn happening i think in in archaeological discourse um i talk about it in my book so this is another illustration it's from the epilogue of my book where i'm talking about um climate change and and seeing that from the perspective of somebody who works on the pleistocene and how yeah the the context we're in in terms of carbon is unprecedented the situation we are entering into unavoidable is beyond anything any hominin has ever experienced um you know sea levels locked in things like this we can see what sea levels seven meters plus look like in the emian it's not very nice <laughs> for where we are so this is important i think for archaeologists actually to to engage with these ideas and they are um right now cop 26 is happening um there is a huge um climate heritage network um archaeologists are involved in this um and i i guess i would just say this is part of the the way that we think about what is archaeology for what is archaeology about when we do archaeology and um aside from thinking about practicalities or intellectual questions about the material record of the future we also need to to think about the reality of the future and climate heritage network is all about considering the ways that understanding the past and also 
ensuring the past and the record of the past is preserved, but how these can relate to things like technological sustainability and resilience. So yeah, really I would sort of just like to end the talk there. Um, and I hope it's been interesting. Stop sharing my screen. No. Okay, thanks, Becky. That was really, really good. A uh, very interesting talk, and um, you know, some really interesting points for my own research. Um, so, thanks for that. It's very interesting. Um, Lucy's written a question in the chat. Unfortunately, oh. she can't speak at the moment. She's got laryngitis. So. Oh, hello, Lucy. Um, <laughs> a couple of general questions. Um, what advice do you have for PGRs that may want to follow a similar career path to you? Uh, so not the traditional academic trajectory. And how do you think PGRs can develop new connections with other researchers during their studies? Mm. Um, I think the second question is one answer to the first. <laughs> um make connections um make networks obviously um i actually think um moving between institutions is a good thing um it's not always easy for people to do that for personal reasons or financial reasons things but um i also know that in some senses you know people will say oh there's there's downsides to moving around and all the time um but being able to even temporarily kind of be part of other departments is is a good thing um, and it's healthy. So I think if there are opportunities available to to go and visit, go and talk or, you know, like do short term things, if that works for people, then it's it's always um, important. And I think I've been lucky in that I got a postdoc in France. Um, and although I didn't stay in France, um, it's been so, so sort of important to, to where the rest of my um, activity and things have gone. Like when I was in Spain a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, I, I can't speak Spanish um, and most of the researchers I was talking with could speak English, but um, one of them I did an event can't really speak English as that great but but he could speak French and I could speak French so <laughs> um you know that that sort of the experience of archaeology as an international community is really important other advice I guess I would say um probably nothing very original but I have found personally that being on social media was really good for my ability to maintain connections and make new ones when I wasn't in departments in that period after my PhD when I didn't have a postdoc during my postdoc when I was in a different country and I was cut off from my existing networks I could maintain those and also I, I really do think although there's a lot of negativity and stuff about social media in general um, I do think for for archaeology archaeology in has a really I think supportive and active um, community on there in terms of discussing just archaeology. You know, people do talk about stuff on there. It's a nice way to microblog your ideas about things. Um, so I do think if you're not already very active on there in terms of posting your ideas about archaeology or th making my threads and stuff, it's good. And as I said in a talk yesterday, actually about careers, um, I genuinely think that learning how to write on Twitter helped me distill my writing practice in a way that was good for writing a book. <laughs> um, you know, so I would say, yeah, social media stuff, but specifically in the non-traditional aspect, sorry, this is a terribly long answer. Um, I would also say, don't sort of crush the things that you are interested in or the things that you enjoy doing. Um, and think that they'll never be possible um, for you to do in archaeology, because I think there are ways to do stuff that's non-academic and still have a foot in academia, or there's ways to do creative things while in academia. Um, so I think, yeah, just, you know, don't, don't neglect those other parts of you that maybe um, don't feel like they have anything to do with, with what you do. Um, in academia because maybe they there's room for them in a creative way if you can sort of 
make networks with people. Great, thank you for that. Does anybody else have any questions? So you can either raise your hand or type in the chat. I'd like to hear what people thought about the dig, if anyone's watched it. <laughs> I, I, I watched it um, and I, I agree with what with what you were saying. There were bits of it that are obviously not quite right, but in a sense, you expect that um, from, you know, it's, it's a movie. There's always going to be some element of um, like almost fantasy to it. Um, but I think generally they did it very well. I really think that it was a very nice story to connect to. And it showed archaeology in a way that was actually almost more how it actually is. I thought it was than, beautifully shot as well. Yeah, it was it was yeah. very nice. Yeah. Um, but it was it was interesting for me as well because I actually did my master thesis on um, filming at heritage sites and how oh, that changes cool. people's perceptions. So it was really interesting for me to see that after having done that. And again, that's kind of linking into what I want to do with the PhD. So it's um, fascinating. Yeah. It was, that was, I quite enjoyed the film, it was good. I thought it was quite good as well, but I did have to roll my eyes at the forced <laughs> heterosexual romance. <laughs> Bye people. So, any more questions? So Paige asked the question, has Kindred been translated into Danish yet? Um, it is coming out in Danish. Uh, I can't remember when. I'm not sure I have a date for that, actually. Um, it, what we don't have is his Dutch translation yet, which I think is very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure why that why that is but yes it, it will be it will be coming out and I would I would like to come over there <laughs> if I could get <laughs> yeah we should talk about that so. <laughs> well great talk thank you thank you okay so if there's no more questions I think the main thing is to just say thank you to Becky for a great talk and thank you to all the other presenters for their interesting um, presentations on what they're doing at the moment as well it was great to hear from you all and also thank you very much to Lucy and Karis who also helped to organize the conference and did a lot of work for it so thanks to both of you as well yeah thanks to you as well Emily thanks thanks for having me everyone yeah thank you Becky thank you. hope we can do this in person before long <laughs> yeah, <soon. laughs> thank you thank you everyone bye bye, bye.